Hi, I'm Tim Clark, and this is Conversations About the Vietnam War. My guest today is Steve Lorenzen. Steve was a uh, graduate of O'Day High School in 1964 uh, and served in the U.S. Army. Uh, and hopefully in this conversation, we're going to learn a little bit about uh, not simply uh, the uh, medical support system uh, uh, in terms of uh, what went on in terms of a major conflict overseas for the U.S. Army, but specifically a certain phase of that medical treatment. And uh, uh, with that, Steve, uh, I'll go ahead and uh, let's get into a little of your uh, background. So uh, you had gotten through high school and you went on to uh, university. Where'd you go and when'd you graduate? Went out to the University of Washington uh, starting in 19... Uh, well, let's see, that would have been 1965. Actually, uh, uh, a junior college in 1965, spent two years at Highline Junior College, and then uh, transferred over to the University of Washington in 66 and finished up my uh, degree in personnel and industrial relations. I uh, had a double, double major, and I dabbled a little bit on the side in some other courses as well that I really liked. So I was about, uh, well, I was one quarter late. Instead of graduating in June, it was December of uh, 68 before I uh, got out of there. And you also got a notice in that same month. <laughs> as a matter of fact, my uh, dad gave me a, a birthday present because uh, December 6th was my birthday. And uh, early in the morning as I was getting uh, off to school and he was going to work, he says, oh, I got a present for you. And he says, I got this letter in the mail it's from your Uncle Sam. Wants you to uh, come and visit him for a lengthy stay. So uh, I was able to finish school, uh, have a great Christmas and New Year's, and a little extra time in order to um, uh, play around and relax a little bit before... Uh, January 23rd induction into the U.S. Army. Yeah, 1969. 1969 then, yes. All right, and where did you report for your basic training? Went down to Fort Lewis, um, which uh, I remember very well that particular uh, winter. Uh, it was uh, about three or four days after I got down there before I even got my uh, military attire that it started snowing, and I believe it was about two foot of snow before it stopped dropping. So it was uh, one of those times when I really just about froze my you-know-what off. All right, so uh, because you were a college graduate, uh, that kind of, they kind of singled you out uh, in that early induction? What were they looking for? Well, they were, uh, while I was in basic training, I was approached by a general at one point in a, in a large group and they had, uh, pointed me out as being a college graduate and uh, he had asked me why I don't go to OCS and become an officer. Well, the fact of the matter was is that um, I was waiting for that point at which I got my military occupational specialty, my MOS, and up until that point in time, uh, or once I figured out what that was, I could then choose to go to OCS if I got an occupational specialty that, uh, for instance, would put me out uh, uh, detonating bombs or uh, being the point man in Vietnam. And I got a good MOS, so I decided to stay as a draftee and minimize my time in the Army, if you will. And what position were you actually assigned in? I was to become a uh, medical records specialist. Um, I uh, got out of uh, Fort Lewis and uh, took a little bit of time off and then went down to uh, Fort Ord to go into a class where they taught me all about what I needed to know regarding med medical records keeping within the Army and so on. and. Uh, as it turned out, the class before me did not graduate enough people or any at all, 
and uh, there was no room for me to go in to the class. So they immediately sent me out to the field into a dispensary for basically on-the-job training. Okay, now uh, exactly what is a dispensary in, in military life? A dispensary is uh, set up for, since we were at a uh, basic training uh, fort, uh, it was set up for any injuries that might occur, any colds, flus, any ailment that you might have uh, while you were in basic training. And that also included responsibilities where we uh, gave shots uh, to all of the uh, basic trainees. In fact, they would come in two to three different times while they were in basic training and go through the, uh, the dispensary where we would give them uh, shots with needles, shots with guns, that, that type of thing. And uh, what types of inoculations are they actually getting? Uh, this is before they've actually been assigned a specific locale they're going to. Right. Uh, these types of uh, shots were uh, catching everyone up, for instance, uh, on shots that they may have, uh, should have had during their life or didn't have for whatever reason, as well as shots to uh, uh, be able to go uh, either into Europe or Asia or anywhere else, generalized types of shots like that. Those shots for specific areas, maybe uh, where there's a lot of malaria or something like that, you would get taken care of uh, later on for those types of issues. So the general types of shots are stuff like influenza, smallpox, uh, perhaps polio, uh, yeah. things that you should have had on, along the road. Uh, you, uh, while at Fort Ord, uh, also uh, got pulled into a study uh, group. Right. It was a short, uh, short time after I got into the dispensary, I got word uh, of a, uh, a big U.S. Army health study. And uh, along comes a, a, a second lieutenant fresh into the Army, uh, and he probably knew uh, just, just about the same amount that I knew. At any rate, uh, he asked for volunteers, and I volunteered to, to help him with the study. That's just the kind of person I was. And we became actually pretty good friends as well. Uh, but that health study went on for two or three different months, and uh, I helped him pull together the records out of that dispensary and uh, for all the different uh, uh, companies that would go through that dispensary. And um, in fact, after that, uh, he was offered a promotion to first lieutenant, and uh, uh, he was to set up an office, uh, and any office in the Army at that point in time uh, meant there had to be an officer, a commissioned officer, a non-commissioned officer, and uh, an EM like myself, and that was the minimum complement of an office. Okay, and what was the job that you were taking on as a group? Uh, in, in that office, we were uh, monitoring all of the health needs for all of the dispensaries in California, and uh, uh, we were able to uh, go out and visit some of those d different uh, dispensaries in different areas, for instance, of California. And um, we uh, would assign people coming into uh, Fort Ord uh, to where they were needed. For instance, depending on a particular person coming in, they were all medics, let's put it that way. And where we needed another medic, we would assign them to that particular dispensary. All right, so let's say there's an anti-aircraft uh, facility uh, down off the coastline. Uh, they do live fire, they've got a dispensary, they need a medic and uh, you're going to assign to verify. Exactly. We had the the staffing needs of all the dispensaries and uh, when somebody went overseas, got out of the Army, whatever the case might be, and they were short on staff, uh, as people came into, a, into us, 
we would try to keep that complement going all the time. Now eventually you yourself got reassigned and were supposed to be shipped towards Vietnam. Uh, well, what was that journey all about? Well, it was about eight months after uh, I got into uh, the California dispensary system and then I guess about four months after I was in that office, I got my orders for overseas and that was to go to uh, the Fifth Field Hospital in Bangkok, which as I found out eventually was a very, very good uh, set of orders a great place to be because uh, the Thai government did not allow the military to run around in their military uniforms. There was also no bases where you had your bunk and so on and there were no facilities for food. So it meant that I was forced and you know what sometimes when you're forced you just got to go with the flow. Uh, but I had to wear my civilian clothes all the time, I had to eat in restaurants, and I had to live in a hotel. Now, actuality, uh, evidently there were some negotiations going on between the Thai government and the U.S. military, and that affected your life. What, did, what were they trying to do? Yes. The Thai government at that time was not particularly happy with the uh, U.S. government. So they had put a moratorium that there were to be no new uh, military coming into, uh, into Bangkok. And of course, between the time they cut my orders and I get over there and then they, they review the whole situation, uh, they found out that they couldn't ac accept me into Bangkok, so they changed my orders to uh, Okinawa. And uh, what they basically did is, okay, you're going to go to Okinawa. Now, uh, you'll have to wait until we get a flight for you from Bangkok to Okinawa. So for about three weeks, four weeks, uh, I lived in a hotel, ate in the restaurants, like I said, and just went and visited the rather large uh, city of Bangkok. All right, uh, you actually ended coming all the way back to Seattle, is that correct, on that return? Uh, uh, Be on my way over to uh, Bangkok, I came home from uh, California and uh, spent a couple weeks here in Seattle and then reported down to, I think it was Oakland, and from there uh, they caught us a flight over to uh, uh, Bangkok. We went through... Uh, uh, Alaska and uh, Osaka, Japan, before we got into uh, Bangkok. Okay. Now, when you finally get to Okinawa, uh, is, uh, you're assigned to a Company A, which obviously contains medics, but once again, the well, facility. Uh, there were a problem, there was a problem with the uh, Company A and their facilities. They didn't have enough room for everybody coming in. So again, my orders were changed, uh, basically still to do the same thing, but I had to go live with a different company. Even though I was assigned to company A, I had to go live with company C, and the only room they had left was in a little Quonset hut that would handle about 14 people, I think it was, and four of us in that Quonset hut uh, lived in, uh, in, in there and worked actually in the hospital. And there's a real advantage in the military if you're not housed with the main company. Well, uh, as we'll get into it a little bit later, uh, you'll see that uh, things were pretty good in the hospital. Uh, ac actually, they were very, very good. They took excellent care of the people uh, in the hospital. And uh, I had to eat in the hospital as well we got the very best of food all the time. You'd go in for breakfast. What would you like for breakfast? Well, I'd like some pancakes. No, maybe I'd like some waffles. Well, maybe I'd like some ham and eggs. and Whatever you wanted, they would fix for you, and it would be very good food. Okay. Uh, uh, now, this is uh, actually Camp Kui on Okinawa? Yes, and I the... was... I was sent into the U.S. Army Medical Center 
in the Ryukyu Islands uh, off the coast of Japan uh, in Okinawa, and the hospital was at Camp Kui. Now, this actually was a huge facility. How would you compare it to, say, like Harborview in King County in Seattle? Uh, you know, I, I do not know exactly how many beds there were there, but it was a very, very large facility, larger than anything I've seen here, uh, at least double the size of Harborview, uh, if not triple the size of Harborview. And uh, we discovered eventually uh, in my conversation with you that that hospital had to also deal with climate uh, off of Japan. Yeah. And uh, so you had unusual threats. What were they like? Well, uh, being out there uh, in the middle of the ocean, so to speak, we would get typhoons that would come in. And uh, while I lived in a Quonset hut, uh, they would give us regular weather updates. And when there was a typhoon approaching, they would send us out a, a notice that we were at, for instance, level three, which meant that there is a typhoon out there. It could get to the island within 72 hours. And as, as time progressed, they would update that uh, or perhaps go backwards saying maybe the typhoon had gone off in a different direction. But uh, if it got to the point where uh, it could be on island within 24 hours, we were then to uh, stay and we were prohibited from leaving the hospital. This meant that the whole time the typhoon was anywhere within 24 hours of being on island, whether it was coming towards you or even going away, we had to stay in the hospital. And the going away part brings into the situation where they've had some uh, typhoons that have come across island, gone out, turned around, and come back. So they, they protected us uh, uh, in that respect to make sure that uh, everybody was safe until the typhoon was truly gone. But you are kind of on your own once you're locked down for a 24-hour period in a hospital. Yes, you, you had to provide for yourself and anything you wanted along the way. Uh, which certainly you would think, well, where do you sleep, you know? Well, it was first come, first serve over there. If you could find a bed, great. You know, that was, that was really super. If you couldn't find a bed, maybe you could find a couch or, or a, a mattress on a floor or something. If you didn't find any of those, you might be sitting in a chair overnight and sleeping that way. But you were in the hospital not to leave for... Uh, the whole duration of that typhoon. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the, the uh, service uh, for being provided by that medical center hospital. Yeah, so you're getting airlifted patients. Uh, they're all coming from Vietnam. Uh, but there is a category that you're actually treating there in the island. So uh, who aren't you getting, who are you getting, and who goes on? The, um, the Okinawa Hospital was one of, I think, about two or three different hospitals that would accept people out of uh, Vietnam. And what would happen is that if a person was injured in uh, Vietnam and they would recover within 30 days, then they stayed in Vietnam for that duration uh, until they recovered and then they would go back to duty. Uh, let's skip to the other end of the, the continuum, so to speak. If they were not going to recover within 180 days, they would go directly back to the U.S. to a, uh, a facility closest to their home. Uh, if they were coming into Washington, uh, let's say, they would go to Madigan General down at, at Fort Lewis, or Texas, they'd go into San Antonio. They would look and make sure you got into the closest place to home. That time frame, though, between 30 days and 180 days is where the hospital in Okinawa uh, received their personnel. And, and those people, whatever, whatever it was that they needed uh, during that time frame, they would take care of it there. 
in that hospital. So you're getting both physical and mental uh, patients being transferred on, is that correct? Yes. We've all seen uh, people, whether it be car crashes and so on, you know, uh, casts on their arms, casts on their legs, arms suspended, that sort of thing. And, and while it's truly a, a very sad situation, the one thing that really affected me the most was also the mental patients that would come in. I would, for instance, see somebody repetitively over a period of time, and you would get to notice that they were being assisted, walked with someone else that would take them to lunch or, or breakfast or dinner, and, um, and they would just be kind of walking along. And then maybe you'd notice that they never talked. And then maybe you would notice that their eyes were just the, you know, where they were not seeing what was going on around them. They were not hearing, they were not communicating. And it was truly those mental patients that uh, uh, really affected me personally, because you just don't know when will they come out of it? Will it be a month, a year? Will they ever come out of it? Uh, that affected me. All right. Now, realistically, the in your you were not trained as a medic. You were in medical records. <clears throat> your actual title was third party adjudication. So you're going to have to walk us through that one. I was assigned to the medical records office, and within that office, there were uh, three or four different primary duties. One of those was third party adjudication, and uh, what that meant to us was that uh, they wanted to classify all injuries uh, regarding whether they were a true military uh, type injury that they treated and, and took care of, or whether it might be something where someone else was maybe responsible. For instance, uh, maybe it was a gymnasium that you were at, uh, exercising or something, uh, outside of an, a facility, a, a military facility, and maybe something broke and it broke your arm or broke your leg. Well, then it was a, uh, an issue where th that facility would be responsible for your treatment monetarily. Uh, and that's what I was primarily responsible for, was to determine who's, uh, uh, who was responsible for it. And of course, we took care of all of the uh, personnel wives and so on that might be around as well. So you had housing for a family on base? Uh, they were, there was no housing on base but there were there was housing outside of the base. Uh, and and uh, once in a while, you actually got dragged out on emergency uh, response uh, for uh, uh, incoming patients. What what would cause that? It was it was really a, an all hands on deck. We would get helicopters that would come in quite regularly, uh, and uh, there would be personnel on the helicopters. Uh, and they were being flown in. Uh, obviously, it's a little bit too far from Vietnam, so I suspect it was off Navy ships or something like that that were being uh, transported in, and, and they would go into the hospital. Sometimes they, uh, they would actually have some of their family that would come to greet them as well. Uh, you talk about a, a, a heartwarming, tear-jerking situation when somebody is coming back out of Vietnam hurt like that and, and, and maybe your wife is there to greet you and so on, it was really nice to see. But uh, whoever was available at that point in time, we'd, we'd head on out and we'd, we'd pull the stretchers on into the hospital. Okay. Uh, now basically, uh, it is nevertheless an, an eight to five day if it's a regular week, is that correct? Yes, uh, my primary responsibility was the third party adjudication as well as uh, I would research for records for 
for people that, that came into the hospital and, and maybe their medical records weren't with them. So I would have to, at times, call all around the world, uh, depending on the time zones, when, when I was at work and they were at work as well. And I would call various bases throughout all of the US, Germany, wherever, uh, and, and seek to find their medical records so that they could come on, uh, get to the patient and so on and further their care. So if I can, Steve, I'm going to say that uh, I'm guessing an example would be there was a demand for a specialist who'd been lost in Vietnam. They assigned somebody uh, for argument's sake. Let's have them uh, come out of North Dakota. Uh, they're flown in country to quickly fill in the gap of that special need, but they get wounded. Yes. And so then you're going to end up having to go backwards. You've got the medical record from Vietnam in terms of the type of wound, but you don't have the person's personnel record that helps you identify other things that might be under treatment and so forth. Sure, sometimes um, there may be other issues that come up along the way uh, and they need to have the background, uh, the total background, the full background of that individual and maybe what had happened to them throughout their life up to that point in time, which may affect treatment or, or help direct the, uh, the treatment for that individual. So a classic would be they'd had a prior medical condition, perhaps surgery. Uh, surgeons now looking at an anomaly in terms of looking at the x-rays and needs to understand what he's going to encounter, something of that nature. Sure. Uh, a lot of the people that would come in, of course, they were going to be there for uh, well, up, up to five months, uh, they may need uh, a number of different surgeries, uh, continuation of certain medications, maybe a reoccurrence of some condition that they had had in the past, all of which had to be treated and, and without the medical records for prior history, uh, the doctors weren't really know, didn't really know what they were looking at. So, and did you also, uh, uh, when you say multiple treatments, it could be things like skin grafts uh, and uh, uh, significant layered uh, treatment? Sure, it could be skin grafts, it could be uh, bone reconstruction, uh, maybe to replace bone, uh, maybe I'm thinking like maybe in terms of uh, facial uh, reconstruction, uh, where you've got to kind of build it up and, build up a new ho nose or, uh, or start implanting uh, bone so that it attaches and uh, med medical field is not my, not my expertise uh, for, for doctors and so on, but uh, certainly building up the basis for which you can put your, the skin on then later on, that certainly could take uh, several, uh, several months as well as several surgeries. Okay, so let's talk about the system of trying to reach uh, medical records in Georgia. Um, you're calling from Okinawa. What types of things do you have to deal with and how does the system work? Well, first of all, uh, I have to admit that anytime I ever called, I got the very best uh, help that I could. They knew when I was calling from Okinawa and, and uh, uh, John Jones was there, that this was truly a, a very serious situation. So they gave me all the necessary help that they could, but I would have to identify the individual as best I could. Uh, maybe, it was, maybe sometimes there was an issue with how uh, Clark was spelt, for instance. Is it C-L-A-R-K? Is it C-L-A-R-K-E? Uh, exactly what is that social security number, uh, maybe there's one digit that's off and, and that could lead for the records to be going somewhere else instead of with the individual. We had to ferret that all out, find the particular records, and it's amazing how many times there I had found while I was working there where uh, simple, simple, very simple mistakes were made, you know, it's, it's very easy to understand how they could be made where uh, one letter changes the 
you know, the persona of who that individual is or maybe uh, one number. Okay, what about the radio telephone system? Well, that was a service that was uh, there uh, for the patients and for the people that worked in the hospital as well. Uh, for my part, I was able to uh, put in for a call back to the U.S. Uh, I wanted to alert my, my folks uh, back in, in Seattle, Washington, uh, that I was going to be coming home uh, legally, and that I'll tell you about another little story here in a minute that just popped in mind, but uh, uh, I wanted to talk to my uh, whoever I could get, my mother or my father. Well, uh, they would set it up. I would set parameters on, on when they would be available in the U.S., and we'd have to coordinate that with the time that I was available uh, on island uh, in Okinawa. Well, eventually they found uh, time to do that, and they placed a radio telephone call, which went all the way around the world and wound up, I got extremely lucky because it could have been picked up anywhere in the U.S., but it got picked up in Bellevue. And then it was a simple matter of reconnecting that call, dialing my, my home number in, in Seattle, and, uh, and then I was able to talk to my father. And of course you go, hello dad, this is Steve, over. And you'd wait for a few seconds because there was quite a bit of uh, lag in that phone call. And then he could say something back. And, and of course, you're not very good at that the very first time you do it, so you wind up talking over each other as well, but I was able to uh, uh, get a call back to the U.S., which I think was, uh, let's see, it was about noon Okinawa time when I put the call in, and, and it was picked up here in uh, Seattle uh, the previous day at uh, 4 p.m., I think is what it was. So I think that's about a 20-hour difference. Uh, now, but that's the same system you're using calling back to San Antonio, Texas, trying to locate a record. Is that correct? No, it was a, it was a different system. When I needed to go to find a medical record, I w had a master sheet that I had all the different uh, facilities, uh, for that matter, around the world. And I could Army call facilities. Army facilities. And I could call directly into any base uh, and, and talk to somebody directly right then and there. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, as you're uh, going through your work week, um, you also uh, are dealing with patients and some of their needs. Is that correct? Um, you uh, eventually, uh, people get forwarded on uh, to, say, Madigan, uh, Fort Madigan in, in Washington? Yes. Um, some of the mo more critical cases, or the critical cases, uh, they don't wait for anything. Uh, you know, they're going to give these people the very best of care, and that meant that they would really be expressed back to a medical facility. Uh, sometimes it was not possible for them to uh, match up their baggage. So we had a, a, a baggage office that would try to make sure that the baggage went with the personnel as they went on back, but sometimes uh, that wasn't possible. So we had a, a, a classification of unaccompanied baggage. And uh, since I was part of that office was part of the, the records office as well, um, I was given the opportunity to uh, forward uh, some of my stereo equipment that I had bought uh, when I was in uh, Okinawa, and uh, I sent it back as unaccompanied patient baggage. And then after I got back to Fort Lewis, I uh, went down there and picked it up, and it was all perfect shape. So uh, let's talk about your uh, uh, disconnecting from military service. So you've been on Okinawa, what, about 10 months, is that correct? Yes, it was about nine or 10 months. Uh, it was in early January then of 1971, 
and um, I got my uh, release from the Army that uh, I could start heading back home and, uh, and eventually get out of the Army. So um, I picked up all my stuff, got my baggage put together, took it to the baggage office to be sent back as unaccompanied patient baggage, and then I made my way on back uh, via uh, military flights. Uh, they were, most of these were primarily uh, uh, regular airline flights, commercial airline flights, where they may take the whole plane or they may take a portion of the plane, whatever it was, but I got a ticket to come on back. I, uh, it was, this one coming back was not just military, so it was just a commercial flight. I went back into uh, Oakland, I think it was. Uh, I was there for a couple of days and then uh, they got all my records pulled together and uh, they figured out how much money they owed me to, to get me out the door and they went to the office and they started peeling off hundred dollar bills until they, they had enough and I got all, all of it in cash and then made my way uh, uh, back, picked up my baggage and um, said sayonara so to speak and then I was totally on my own to make it back home uh, by whatever means I could, which in my case, I just caught a commercial flight back. All right, so you're back in Seattle. You're now going to find your way in the real world. Uh, you assume that you've got a college degree. Uh, you've worked in uh, personnel records. Uh, you're going to start uh, eventually applying for jobs. What goes on? Right. Well, I got back to, got back to Seattle and... Um, Quite frankly, I, I wasn't too interested in becoming the uh, uh, A number one uh, citizen, not that I was going to be illegal, but I fooled around for a couple of months and uh, got re reattached to friends and that sort of thing. Uh, and because of the work I was doing prior to going into the Army, I was able to go back to that job. And then I started putting together my resume uh, I had a college degree. I thought I could get a, a pretty good job, uh, but it was 1971, and uh, one of the first signs that I saw when I got uh, back to Seattle was uh, the sign that said, last person leaving Seattle, please turn off the lights. But at any rate, I put together my resume and applied for as many jobs as I could uh, in personnel which was my major, and uh, after a while it became very evident that uh, I was competing for these uh, very low-rung personnel jobs along with people who had been uh, laid off from other jobs with perhaps 10 years experience. And those folks, maybe they had two, three, five, ten years experience, they wanted the job so anybody hiring would certainly hire them before they would me until the economy got a lot better. I was just was not going to get a job in that area. So that caused a reconsideration and what did you finally make out of that? Well, I decided to go back to school, went back to trade school and uh, got, a job, uh, got a degree or certificate, if you will, in computers. Uh, programming and, and operation of computers and then eventually got a job in a, in a company uh, uh, operating and programming and that was the start of my career then which lasted for about 30 years uh, uh, until I retired uh, in computers. Well thank you Steve. This has been Tim Clark in Conversations of the Vietnam Conflict and uh, my guest has been Steve Lorenzen. Thanks again for coming and being with us. Thank you Tim. Appreciate it.